Terra Zignora and the Seven Jeweled Lighthouse by Samantha B. Adra. Chapter 3 The Paranakan Mansion. Quote, Our grandmother told us that Guanin has the power of unconditional love and transcendent wisdom. Whenever you are in trouble, just call her name and she will come to your aid. All you need is to have faith in her. Unquote. After seven years of studying and working in Singapore, the Lion City was a place where Tara called home. She was glad when she walked out of the airport and smelled its fresh air. It was a beautiful garden city with an abundance of nature and greenery. The breaking of dawn was especially beautiful. Gloomy clouds that loomed ominously on the horizon slowly disappeared, replaced by the orange-pinkish hues that splashed across the sky like the work of an impressionist artist. Tara and Mia took a taxi back to Mia's home in Emerald Hill. They passed by Singapore's iconic landmarks such as the Marina Bay Sands, the Art Science Museum, the Gardens by the Bay, and the Mare Lion. Tara adored the Mare Lion, the mythical creature with the head of a lion and the tail of a fish. The lion was the king of the jungle, and a fish tail was the passport to freedom in the ocean. Best of both worlds, she thought. After taking a turn into Emerald Hill Road, the taxi drove past an entire stretch of road with colorful Paranakan shop houses. Paranakan, also known as Straits Chinese, is a distinctive community with mixed Chinese and Malay slash Indonesian heritage living in Malaysia and Singapore. Many Paranakans can be traced back to the Chinese diaspora in the 15th century. These Chinese merchants came from China to Malacca or Singapore and they subsequently married the local Malay women. The male is known as Baba and the female is known as Nyonya. Many of the Paranakan cultures and practices are a potpourri of Indonesian, Malay and Chinese traditions. Tara saw a group of five ladies dressed in the Nyonya blouse and Javanese batik sarong, mingling around and giggling among each other. Some of the ladies noticed Tara looking at them, and they smiled back indulgently. Mia, did you see the group of ladies in the traditional Nyonya attire at that shop houses? They look so lovely and charming. Tara commented, nudging Mia to take a look. Where are they? Mia followed Tara's direction she saw no one donning the Nyonya attire. Tara craned her neck and pointed to the shop house again. Right in front of the orange Paranakan house. They are still there. Don't you see them? Mia shook her head, wondering what was wrong with Tara's eyes, there was absolutely Tara gave a bewildered look at Mia, wondering if she had seen something others could not see. The taxi pulled over in front of a grand paranakan styled bungalow which caught Tara's attention. Mia's father named it the Blue Mansion as the entire bungalow was painted a shade of pastel blue. The main door was made up of teakwood and looked magnificent. The walls on each side of the door were adorned by a pair of huge traditional Chinese red lanterns on each side. There was a red, wooden plaque with gold-gilded Chinese calligraphic characters. A Chinese idiom that means always remembering one's roots with gratitude for our predecessors. Welcome back, mom. A domestic helper cheerfully greeted them at the door. Please, let me help you with the baggage. The bungalow was cavernous and the interior resembled a tastefully curated private museum. Taking a walk in the bungalow made them feel as if they were stepping back in time. Everything, right from the floor and the wall tiles, to the light fittings and even the furniture were made up of both Chinese and Paranakan antiques. The eclectic balance in which the antique Paranakan were arranged harmoniously was refreshingly impressive. Tara headed to the living room and settled down on a set of ornate mahogany Chinese sofa inlaid with Mother of Pearl's dragon motifs. The sight of the antiques and the sensation of her tired feet on the large rectangular Persian silk carpet reminded Tara of her late mother who was a Chinese antique collector. Her eyes fell on the Four Seasons Chinese landscape paintings and she was moved by the inexplicable beauty. Colorful Paranakan objet d'art such as the Tinkat, food carrier, covered jars, as well as Chinese antiques such as Ming Dynasty blue-white porcelain vases, Yixing purple clay teapots, and bronze vessels were prominently displayed in the lacquered rosewood cabinet. There were traditional Chinese round bookshelves with some spiritual books arranged neatly on the shelves, The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama, The Miracle of Mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh, Still Thoughts, Jing Si Aphorisms by Master Ching Yen, The Art of Forgiveness by Jack Kornfield, Real Happiness by Sharon Salzberg, How to Free Your Mind by Thupton Kodron.
Numerous medals, trophies, and silver plates of accolades awarded to Mia's father for his philanthropic works, clan associations, and temple activities were displayed on the elaborately carved Elmwood cabinet. There was also a human acupuncture model, a figurine showing red points and lines. That was a reminder of Mia's father's profession as a traditional Chinese physician who subsequently established a global conglomerate selling a range of health products. Mia's husband, Wei Guang, took over the management of her late father's business after his demise. After relaxing for a while, they were ready for a scrumptious meal. Traditional Myonia delicacies such as K Dadar, K Salat, K Lapis, and Onda Onda were served on pink and turquoise green Paranakan plates on a round, white limestone dining table. Tara, please help yourself to some Myonia K, said Mia. I'm sorry about the passing of your father. Tara said empathetically. Her thoughts drifted back to her deceased loved ones which brought a pang of sharp pain in her heart. Tara thought it was a blessing in disguise that Auntie Su Lian and her husband did not attend her wedding in Lankui because of the bereavement ceremony of Su Lian's father-in-law who passed away one week before her wedding. It was a Chinese taboo for those who were in grief to attend joyous occasions such as a wedding. Parting is always painful, especially with our loved ones. Sighed Mia. Death is an excellent reminder that nothing is permanent in this world. We need to cherish our loved ones while they are still alive. Yes, filial piety is the most fundamental expression of love. Now that it's the Chinese seventh month, I'm sure your mom will be busy with the Ulambana festival soon. Tara said. The Ulambana festival, celebrated on the 15th of the seventh month in the lunar calendar, is also known as the Hungry Ghost Festival in Chinese culture. The festival originated from ancient India. Tara first heard about it from her mother Su Li when she was five years old. The stories of rebirth and reincarnation fascinated her. Maud Gulyana, foremost in supernatural powers, was a disciple of the Buddha. Through his divine powers, he realized his deceased mother was reborn in the hungry ghost realm. He tried to help her by giving her a bowl of rice. However, his mother could not consume it because the rice was transformed into burning coal. The Buddha advised Madhvayana to give food offerings to the accomplished arahants and transferred the merits back to his deceased mother. This was the way to release her mother from the hungry ghost realm. In short, the Ulambana festival is a celebration of love, filial piety, and gratitude for their deceased loved ones. My late dad was 86 years old. The philanthropic works in clan associations and temple activities were his greatest joy and pride. Mia said. He was proud to play a part in preserving the Chinese traditions and the Paranakan culture in the community. Just as she finished the sentence, the delightful scent of the sandalwood wafted in the air. Tara felt comforted when she heard the resonant sound of a bronze bell signaling the initiation of a prayer ritual coming from the prayer room. Auntie Su Lian looked prim and polished in the traditional blue and white Chinese Changsam. Since Tara's mother had passed on, Auntie Su Lian helped Tara with the Chinese pre-wedding customs. In the betrothal ceremony, Guadali, Auntie Su Lian accepted the betrothal gifts on behalf of Tara's father and her late mother. She also forked out her own expenses to prepare Tara's dowry and wedding bed installation. Tara was grateful and indebted to her. Su Lian began her daily devotional practices reciting verses of the Lotus Sutra. Bodhisattva Valakitasvara, homage to Shakyamuni Buddha, homage to the Lotus Sutra of the Marvelous Dharma, homage to Prajna Paramita. Every day I am thinking, how can I lead all living beings to enter the unsurpassed way and quickly acquire the body of a Buddha? May the merits and virtues benefit all living beings. May I and all living beings attain Buddhahood together. After Su Lian completed the recitation, she continued to chant Namo Guan Shur Ing Pu Sa, devotion to Avalokitesvara three times before retreating to her 30-minute meditation. My mom is devoted to Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy. She is sending her earnest prayers to my late father every day, said Mia. Tara took a peek at the prayer room. In the middle of the ornate mahogany altar was a wooden carving of Guan Yin seated in a royalese pose. With her left arm placed beside her body, she rested her right arm on her raised right leg. The beautiful statue was the epitome of Guan Yin's loving grace and equanimity. Beneath the Guan Yin statue was the elaborately carved ancestral tablets. 
In front of the ancestral tablets was a small, auburn statue of Shakyamuni Buddha seated in the meditation position. The moment Tara's eyes met the beautiful statue of the Goddess of Mercy, an inexplicable feeling of peace, joy, and veneration arose in her heart. Wow, this statue of the Goddess of Mercy is so magnificently splendid! Tara exclaimed. This Guan Yin statue is our precious family heirloom. It was an imperial gift given by the Qing Emperor to honor our great-great-grandfather for his service and contribution during the Qing dynasty of China. Mia said. Our grandmother told us that Guan Yin has the power of unconditional love and transcendent wisdom. Whenever you are in trouble, just call her name and she will come to your aid. All you need is to have faith in her. The name, Guan Shireen, contains tremendous power. Yes, our grandmother often sang praises of the power of Guan Yin. Tara chuckled. She remembered how her mother, Su Li, frequented the renowned Kek Loxi Temple while in Penang. The gigantic goddess of mercy standing in the temple's pavilion was still vivid in her mind. Clomp, clomp, clomp. Mia's younger brother, Ryan, and Mia's two children, Avery and Brendan, came thundering down the staircase. Hunky and athletic, Ryan was passionate about bodybuilding, nature, and sports. Sis, I'm going to Polo Yubin for a nature outing. Ryan joyfully chirped as he lugged along his DSLR Canon camera, tripods, and all the necessary paraphernalia of a professional photographer. I plan to visit Czech Jawa to discover wildlife and take some photos. I love nature, may I join you guys? Tara said her eyes were glinting with anticipation. For the past three months, she had been cooped up at her grandparents' house in Penang, waiting in vain for any news of her loved one's bodies being discovered. She hardly stepped out, which almost drove her nuts. As a self-proclaimed nature buff, she was thrilled at the prospect of getting back to nature. Why not? Come join us. Ryan readily agreed. Splendid. Tara squealed with delight. I can't wait to enjoy nature's embrace again. Just then, Mia's youngest sister, Kia, came over and put some of the Myonia K into a colorful Paranakan food container. Kia, would you like to join us for the Polo Yubin nature trip? Asked Mia. Sis, you know a nature trip has not been my cup of tea ever since I finished the Missing 411 series by David Paulides. Anyway, today is the Chi Shi Festival and I am going to attend the singles event organized by the Hokkien Clan Association and the Singapore Chinese Cultural Center. It's going to be fun mingling with new friends. Chi Shi Festival was the Chinese Valentine's Day. Legend had it that the two lovers, Niu Long, a cowherd in the human world, and Ji Nu, a weaver from the heavenly world, would reunite once a year on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month. They would meet on a bridge made by a flock of magpies. Enjoy yourself and have fun. Who knows, if you are lucky, perhaps you can even fish a golden turtle. Mia chuckled, teasing Kia, who was still single and looking for a suitable partner. Petite and charming with her thick, long black hair, Kia looked attractive in a salmon pink floral dress. But her high expectations of Mr. Wright was a stumbling block for her. Have fun in Yubin. Ciao. Kia stepped out with a slight bounce. Sporting a teal boatneck top with dark, denim shorts, Tara was ready for her nature adventure. She took a picnic basket along and walked past the living room. Something captured her attention, a wrinkled elderly man wearing Qing Dynasty attire sat all alone on a wicker rocking chair placed just next to the bookshelves. The moment Tara saw the man wearing the Qing Dynasty attire, she knew something was not right. Am I seeing a ghost? Or an apparition? Is there a guest with us now? I saw someone sitting in the living room. Tara remarked. A guest? I don't think we have any guests with us now. Mia replied with a slightly puzzled frown. She glanced at the living room but she saw no one there. There isn't anyone there in the living room. But Tara remained unconvinced. But he is sitting on the rocking chair. Intrigued, Ryan took a glimpse of the living room but he too, did not see anyone there. I don't see anyone either. Baffled, Tara wanted to double-check what she saw. 
Yes, the elderly man was still sitting on the rocking chair, enjoying himself with a slight rock. Then, the elderly man turned his head and shot a stern penetrating glare at Tara, making her gut lurch with a panicked somersault. For a moment, Tara was stunned, she saw something only she could see, not Mia and Ryan. He is right there, sitting at the rocking chair, staring at me now. She quickly rummaged in her tiny, round rot tan sling bag, scrambling to find her phone so that she could take a picture to prove it to Mia and Ryan. When she finally took out the phone and looked up, the elderly man was no longer there. Disconcerted, she blinked with disbelief, wondering if her eyes had just played a trick on her. With her heart thumping and her legs weak and wobbling, she thought, who is this person I just saw? Could it be one of Mia's ancestors? Are you all right, Tara? Mia noticed Tara's anxiety. I think, I think. I've just seen a spirit. Tara stammered in a quivering voice. Her whole body was trembling uncontrollably. A spirit? Are you sure? Ryan was skeptical that his well-kept house would attract any supernatural beings. There may be ghosts elsewhere, but definitely not in our house. He was an old man wearing ancient Qing dynasty attire. Tara muttered with glazed eyes. She thought about the tragic accidents of her loved ones. Would they become wandering spirits and ghosts as well? For a moment, Mia was silent. Tara was not the only one who saw an old man wearing the same attire in this house, her devoted mother had seen him too. She knew Tara was not bluffing. Tara is not the only one who has seen it, mother had seen the old man before. Sis, are you kidding me? Hey, it's the Chinese seventh month now. Don't scare me, laugh. Ryan was petrified, staring with confusion and fear at the rocking chair that was still slightly rocking. Not all spirits are diabolical, some are benevolent and they help people. I'm sure the spirits you saw are our ancestors who protect us. Mia remarked confidently. Remember. Grandma told us before about how our ancestors protected Aunt Sue Lawn during childbirth. Ryan nodded, half convinced by his sister's assurance. Tara also believed that it could be the spirit of Mia's ancestor, and there was nothing to be paranoid about. Meanwhile, Brendan, Mia's five-year-old boy, was quietly standing in one corner, looking at the rocking chair. Mommy, Auntie Tara was right, an old man was sitting on the rocking chair just now. The whole room became so still and silent that a pin drop could be heard. Dong, dong, dong. The grandfather clock struck 8 o'clock in the morning, interrupting their stunned stupor and reminding them to tarry no more for their nature outing. 